I think it was three months ago, uh, I was asked for a title for a talk that I hadn't even thought about. And uh, I gave them the title, uh, uh, To Build in Context. Um, since then, I've worked on the talk. And <laughs> I'm still going to include context, but I found an overarching uh, uh, title. And it's uh, the title, present title is, It's Gotta Be Love. It couldn't be tonsillitis, <laughs> with apologies to our own Cole Porter. My uh, format this evening is to read to you uh, my paper, a sort of um, summation of things that I've been thinking about for a long time, and uh, not interrupt them with uh, the usual slideshow. And then at the end of the talk, <clears throat> there will be uh, just a handful of slides of our misdeeds uh, through, the, through the years. And uh, sort of like uh, a book with the illustrations uh, all at the rear. And uh, so if you bear with me and can stay awake, uh, there will be slides at the end. <laughs> Uh, modern architecture, it seems to me, has tended to emphasize technical, social, or political interests in the expense, at the expense of poetry, not to say beauty. Poetry is not in the canon. It is, if anything, a bit frightening. Eros and poetry are sisters. Among the expressions of eros in buildings are the following. Revealing the context. There you are, context. <laughs> Composing interior and exterior spaces, as would a sculptor. Orchestrating the sources of light. Employing color, as would a painter. And using rhythm, like a musician. These are my subjects tonight. Uh, my first building was a summer house for the Yale professor Beecher Hogan and his wife Carolyn Crosby. It's located on a narrow peninsula in Vermont, jutting into Lake Champlain with a choice view of the Adirondacks on the other side of the lake. It was conceived in 1950 when I was still in architecture school in New Haven. Thus began what alarmingly turns out to be six decades of searching for romantic persons and magic places in which to build. I could never stop, even today. What is the root of this addiction? Let us look at the usual suspects. First, I can say it wasn't money, for I never made any to speak of. <laughs> I ignored my f f father's uh, stern advice and early warning about uh, architects and, uh, and their incomes. I think they were slightly above barbers' incomes <laughs> at, at that point. Uh, And I plowed blindly ahead in spite of his advice. Second, I might add th that it was not fame because I neglected the obvious paths to such. Unlike my contemporary and friend, Michael Graves, for example, I didn't gravitate to New York City metropolitan scene and join an avant-garde group or become a stalwart adherent to a particular style. Please understand this was, is, a commendable direction for anybody else. I just did not do it. Who knows why? There are no regrets. Thirdly, it was not that I was unfit for 
another profession, uh, but in parentheses, some would say that's close to the mark. <laughs> there was just nothing else that gripped me half so f much. So now I look back on this long practice to discover what was the underlying motivation. And I see there is one thread that runs through the whole history, and that thread is love. I will not call upon Plato here for support. I will not distinguish between Eros and Agape. It's just unconditional love with an open heart. Love is, I've found, a contact sport. Intentions are not enough. Architecture is action. Three months ago, I was in Brazil, from whence I emailed the curators of this show that's open to tomorrow night, uh, with a suggested title, and it was, quote, to build for love. Their immediate response was, quote, what is he smoking down there? <laughs> Needless to say, that suggestion sank into the abyss. I keenly wish that I'd been consciously aware of this thread from the beginning, but I was not in control. Something beyond my little mind was guiding me through the obstacle course of life, sometimes quite in spite of my egoic resistance. In the beginning, it was so unlikely for the Hokans to have chosen this stripling to work on their house on the water, but I already had a strong affection for them both, for the Vermont of my ancestors, and for water of any size. This first effort gave me a taste of blood. After graduation, uh, as Mark has mentioned, I did three houses in New Canaan, moonlighting, while working for Philip Johnson. I happened to tell him once how thrilling it was to see the framework rising, and he replied, oh yes, it's the wine of life. Later, back home again in Indiana, as the song goes, as larger commissions slowly began to come to us, I see that, that, that relationships, not reputation, continued to guide our creative process. Among them were Edith and Alan Close, Elvis Starr of Indiana University, Jack Duggan of St. Mary's, Abbott Timothy for St. Meinrad, Kathy Gibson of the Central Library, Jane Owen, and on and on and on. These are the folk that I trusted from the outset, but the friendships deepened inevitably as we worked together. Now, it did not always fall into place. I did not know then that nearly everyone is in some way lovable if you would just penetrate uh, their barriers without judgment. So I regretfully assume the blame in all such cases. I know now that conflict does not produce good architecture. Does it sound like I'm only speaking to young architects? No, I would wish to talk with all who harbor some awareness of their environment. By now, you have gathered it is, it is not just relationships that feed on eros. One must be drawn to the place, the genius loci, um, the history, the culture. Uh, the great Le Corbusier famously said, quote, the house is a machine for living, unquote. The, 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 the real joke is that he was a poet in spite of such a materialistic pronouncement. Today, an architect like Calatrava is a welcome departure from the old modernism. 
Robert Venturi also, in his own idiosyncratic way, has been an inspiration through his writing as well as his design. Christopher Tunnard, a name you, few of you would know, a revered teacher in grad school, was a city planner and a landscape architect of, of great renown, in England especially. When asked uh, a technical question uh, uh, by a student, he raised his hand sort of like Jack Benny used to do, you know, out like this, and this was his way. And he said, quote, I am a student of beauty. Ask our engineer, Mr. Spielvogel, unquote. <laughs> this occasioned gales of laughter from the students. But I'm not laughing now. Chris was speaking his truth in an era in which no one else would quite venture such a thing. So much is written about the source of creativity. I would swiftly dis dispatch this in a few words. Um, I happen to see any artist as the medium who tr simply transmits solutions from the universe. Or another way of putting this, creation does not come from the mind, but by way of the heart. Yes, it requires humility to embrace this. One must just cool it and allow no attention to the inanities of the left brain. It required years for me to fully comprehend that designing in the context of the project's environment was the modest, affectionate thing to do in contrast to making a photogenic statement of modernity. To do this, you will forego having a signature running through all the work. You build on the shoulders of what has been done in each place. You try really, really hard to drop your own baggage, your ego. One must listen not just to the clients, but those all around the clients. Sometimes one must go and live with the clients if that is at all welcome. The rewards will be great. Of course, there are times when, quote, there is no there there, as Gertrude Stein advised us about Oakland. In this event, <laughs> we are free of one of the set of obligations to embrace, one set of obligations to embrace a fresh start in a, in a vacuum. But be forewarned, there are not many such vacuums left. Perhaps a passing example would be doing a house in the deep country a la Richard Meyer. I would suggest that anyone who turns their back on what is already present will be unhappily judged in the long view of history, if that matters to them. It does matter to those of us who, that visually luxuriate in walking cities like Paris, Prague, and Venice, where everything seems to combine into the continuum, uh, where buildings respect one another, where the sense of collectivity of the place is more important than the object. Um, I've often wondered why is it considered reactionary that a new building would have a conversation with older buildings without tarnishing its newness. There is an old Chinese proverb, quote, to ford a river, one must feel the stones with one's foot, unquote. The composition of space is so much more than the literal translation of a written program to a drawing. It is the imagination of the walking sequence through the spaces 
And that's what I mean by feeling it with your foot. That sometimes squeeze and sometimes burst with laughter into larger spaces. How one gracefully descends and ascends is all art. An element of surprise and delight is essential. And then there is the site plan, the exterior progress, the footpath through space is no less important than the interior. What will one perceive first? How does the landscape prepare you? How does one work with raw nature, great trees, small bushes, the whole gamut? What direction do surrounding structures send? It all, if all this sounds mystical, well, it is just that. Mies van der Rohe opened the eyes of my generation to the maximum possibilities of daylight in the interiors of our lives. Of course, the joy of daylight in architecture is as old as the mouth of the cave. Who can forget walking into the Pantheon on a sunny day or spending several hours in Chartres Cathedral as the light and the colors shift? Poets and painters are prepared to visualize the spectrum of options of light and shadow in the built environment. Arch architects, I think, need to gently give their clients a valentine that they did not know they wanted. I myself am a glutton for light, always raising shades and pushing curtains aside wherever I go, a very annoying guest. I am, I am like a plant. <laughs> then I ask you to think about this. Is not color an intensified form of light? Color alone would seem to offer a great range of expression and meaning. Why is it eschewed by so many of us in our Western culture? In Brazil, I found a culture oblivious of puritanical restrictions where color is rampant. I have spent my life somewhat uneasily among the chromophobes. <laughs> that is to find those who fear color. Over and over, many clients have been shocked by our proposals of color. With them, color is off color, as it were. It is too emotional, too scary, in questionable taste. <laughs> it does not make it palatable to explain color is erotic. In fact, that's a m big mistake. That <laughs> One macho client of ours associated color with odor, commenting, quote, this is pretty gamey stuff, Evans, unquote. <laughs> I suggest looking at Luis Barragan, the great Mexican architect, and his estimable descendant, Ricardo Legoreto. I recall glibly saying to my first employer, quote, uh, before we freeze this music, might we take a second look?" Unquote. Yes, this is a tired cliché, but underneath there are analogies that cannot be easily dismissed. Architecture cannot be taken in by a single glance or the snap of a shutter. There are unfolding rhythms, changing tempi, and subtle patterns to emerge. The architectural equivalents uh, to music are akin to fast and slow, loud and soft, complex and clear, tight and expansive. Architecture con brio. John Cage said, quote, we are all musicians, unquote. 
Music takes time to experience its full impact, but architecture, I would argue, takes much more time. There can be a factor of slow release. Sometimes a building is despised at the beginning and beloved at the end, or the reverse, it must be admitted. I will abide by the end myself. So, in conclusion, do not forget the technicians, the politicians, the purists, the rationalists, alas, none of which for, uh, for which I can qualify. But with them in tow, bring back to the footlights the romantic poets and exuberant clients to build our future dreams. I believe we all come to the planet with um, a purpose to fulfill. We are what we are. So I offer you a quotation from Matisse to which I have long been drawn. He was an old man, as I am, when he wrote in 1942 to his friend André Rouvert, quote, to devote my life to the essential thing, the thing for which I am made and which can bring a little happiness to the great family, the greatest spiritual family, unquote. Uh, now we'll look at some slides very informally, and uh, uh, there should be some time for questions, uh, if you have them. Uh, this house is as early as 1956, and it, it is now uh, owned by Tom Vriesman and uh, uh, was built by the Marx family. And uh, this beautiful photograph by Tony Valanis, uh, I think, reveals the interests of mine as long ago as that, which are still present in uh, ongoing uh, work uh, to, to uh, uh, conceive of a big room, to open up to, uh, to the sun, uh, the the. <coughs> The entrance side of this house is, um, is very opaque. You will see, a, if you go to the show at Imoca, you will see a photograph of it, and it reveals almost nothing. And uh, that was a, a kind of curious uh, uh, custom that I've always thought of, that, that houses uh, sh should unfold and not give the whole story away uh, in, the, in the first uh, first glance. Uh, this is not in the show, so that this is kind of, uh, these few slides are at the Salon de Refusé. <laughs> this is uh, St. Mary's Library, which I think is possibly, uh, with the exception of Central Library, is my favorite uh, library that we did. And it's in, Notre it's in the town of Notre Dame at St. Mary's College across the street from Notre Dame. And it has, has a great deal to do with the environment, uh, the architectural environment that was already there, it dictated so much of the character of the, of the uh, building. But you, you uh, pick up little bits of things from your past, and these, these bays along the west side of the building were uh, I think a direct steal from my uh, young adulthood at, as an undergraduate at Yale, lounging in the big leather chairs in Lenonia and, uh, and Brothers Library. Uh, this shows you the campus, gives you a little bit of the character of the oldest buildings on the far right, and those, those buildings are very commanding at the entrance and, and gave us the flavor uh, of the of the library to come. This, this was a place, uh, a, a situation in which 
No one was quite sure what the best place for placing the library was. And we had a general meeting of all people concerned with the campus, students, faculty, trustees, and administration. And it was a kind of pin the tail on the donkey. Who could find a really convincing place to put the, the library? This is not a bad thing to do, by the way, uh, when you have a quandary about the exact placement of a building. And the beautiful thing was that a freshman student uh, listened to all the learned people pinning the, uh, watched them and listened to them as they pinned on various places. And she finally picked up the symbol of the library and put it on a place and everybody uh, drew in their breath because they knew it was the right one. And that's where it was, it was built. And that's just uh, uh, an example of, of uh, listening to everybody you can, no matter how humble or young. Uh, this is the building that so many people love to hate. <laughs> and uh, I don't really uh, want to defend it or change your ideas if you're, if you're set on hating it. That's okay. Um, but I do welcome a chance to, uh, to, to explain to open-minded listeners uh, some of the factors, <laughs> some of the factors that, that dictated the, the, the uh, design of this building. The General Services Administration, our client, was led by a very enlightened architect named Carol Yasko that John Kennedy picked and uh, who was a friend of his and, and he was an exception in this job and he was very um, uh, interested in listening to us. The standard form of the, of the GS building was a, a high-rise building that would have, would have occupied this block, the old Shortridge School block, um, where our, our parents uh, went to high school, uh, would have occupied this block, and, but, but only in the middle, would have left great gapping holes on both sides, and would have gone up possibly as high as the War Memorial. And uh, we, we convinced Carol Yasko that we were beginning the, uh, probably a 100 or 200 year process of enclosing a space, uh, a really remarkably large public space that had no sense of containment at the, or, or had a, a, a missing sense of containment at the present. It had some great buildings, the War Memorial, the Scottish Rite, and, and the somewhat diminutive library, beautiful library by Paul Cray. Uh, so uh, we were able to take the, the usual format of the federal building and, and, and flatten it down so that it w became subservient to the War Memorial and the Scottish Rite and occupied the whole block so that it would help to hold in the space. And the very fact that the building leans very slightly towards you was simply one more um, way of, of making the, the, the uh, space which was otherwise bleeding out to, to, to be contained. And then we did not use vast amounts of glass uh, which would have been the fashionable thing to do, but we wanted to, to be uh, brothers with the War Memorial, the Scottish Rite, and the, and the um, library, which were all stone. And we are concrete, but with, with uh, a uh, uh, color that's very close to the stone uh, of, of those other buildings. Um, this shows you what we were, uh, this is before the, this plaza was planted with trees and it was even less uh, contained. But to just to remind you of the heroic size of the Halicarnassus of, of roads <laughs> over here. That's what it is. That's the, the, the architect once told me, he was a very old man and, and I happened to meet him and he told me we, we were doing the best to put together uh, a recreation 
of the Halicarnassus. And, and the beautiful library, which was a little small, because the budget was a little small, uh, to hold in this very long and beautiful avenue of, of grass. And, uh, and of course, the interesting thing was that, that in my lifetime, I was able to, to uh, help with the enclosure, not only by the federal building, but with the, with the uh, new Central Library edition, which, which uh, somewhat uh, rises above the old library without hurting it, I, I believe, and, and helps the, the space. But I just want to leave you with the thought that, uh, like, like the great plazas of Europe, you have to wait a very long time. You have to wait lifetimes for things like this to be completed if people have the will to, to uh, keep, keep at it. Uh, th th this is just a, another word about light. This is a uh, church in Cleveland, St. Andrew's Abbey, for a Benedictine community. And it's the light from above coming down on the back uh, wall. And you will, you will see more, another picture of this in the Sh Imoka show that more completely explains the church. Uh, th this is to make you remember that, that you can deal with light simply by apertures that, that go from open space to open space, as in this very modest church uh, that many of you may recognize here in Indianapolis. And uh, this goes on to uh, St. Andrews, uh, St. Uh, Meinrad Abbey, where there's a, a Belvedere looking out over about five miles of countryside that leads to nowhere but just lets light into a cloistered community. Uh, and finally, a uh, library at Central Michigan University uh, that is not, also not in the show. It was a uh, extensive remodeling of a uh, existing building on the left and, and a new addition on the right that somehow, if you could see it in whole, begin to knit together. Uh, there's an interior well. Uh, I think you uh, m may be able to, if you see the exhibit tomorrow, you will realize that we've had a uh, undue, perhaps, obsession with great spaces, with gathering spaces, with central spaces, even in houses. And uh, this this uh, library is no exception. And then I close uh, just to show you that uh, architects sometimes get to build houses for themselves. I didn't get to until I was 74. <laughs> but uh, I, it, was still, it was still not too late. It was still worth doing. And this is a very modest small house on a spectacular piece of land a um, thousand feet above Boulder. And, and this same, same house at, at night. Um, I do want to say in, in uh, closing, I do want to uh, give recognition to my longtime partners, Lynn Molson and Larry O'Connor, who've been w with me uh, almost forever and have, have been <laughs> And uh, so I'm open to your uh, uh, questions, if you have any. <laughs> I was citing, in answer to the question, what, is your fav what are your, some of your favorite buildings through history, I was citing the, the, uh, the, the Palazzo del, del Dogana in Venice, the Doge's Palace, as, as, as one. Uh, I can't say necessarily in any order now because I'm, uh, I'm, I'm uh, just sort of thinking back uh, uh, quickly, but um, I, I'm endlessly fascinated by the great cathedrals, both of England and France, and keep wanting to go back to them and, uh, and, and, and spend time in them. Um, and of course, Greece 
poor Greece, who's in such trouble now. Um, there was a, there was a uh, recent proposal, a serious proposal, that the Greeks sell the Parthenon to get out of debt. Um, the, the painter, the painter was Milton Glaser, and and uh, he was uh, uh, so inspiring to work with, and w we we had talked uh, with a number of artists that the GSA had sent to us, and none of them seemed enthusiastic about uh, the, our idea of a painting that wrapped completely around the building, and until Milton arrived. And he thought it was just great. And, and we described to him uh, roughly a, a sort of a Herculean task. We said, how about a continuous Rothko? <laughs> Wrap it with Rothko. And he said, uh, I'll work on that. <laughs> and he did. And of course, uh, we couldn't have been happier with the results. And, and a large part of Indianapolis couldn't have been unhappier. <laughs> and there are still living people who excoriate Milton Glaser's w uh, work. But, but there again, if you remember in the paper, you know, uh, if we wait long enough, uh, who knows? And if it doesn't fade completely, why, uh, it may someday uh, be be enjoyed by by a larger number of people. I don't mean to say everybody disliked it at all. There there are uh, uh, other allies uh, than ourselves. I think that I think that um, because Indianapolis is um, on such flat land that. Uh, that the towers do, do distinguish the city, and I was never um, I was never anti tower the way so so, so many uh, uh, very literate uh, architects have been, and uh, I didn't think that um, I, I think the towers w would destroy central Paris. They have destroyed central London maybe, uh, and and they're well away from Rome. But I, th I thought that um, they weren't a danger here. So I don't carry uh, any uh, uh, bad feelings about them or, or uh, regrets uh, about them. Some, of course, are better than, than uh, uh, others. Some are more skillfully done. Uh, but um, I always get, when I land in a plane and, and begin to drive from the airport towards the town and, and see um, the profile of San Gimignano, uh, <laughs> I, I think all's well. It's fine. Well, that's what I wanted to show you that, y you know, I, I, that I kept doing the same things all my life. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, this will be disappointing and maybe shocking to you. I, I don't spend any time thinking about my evolution. <laughs> and I leave, will leave that to others. And, uh, you know, perfectly happy to have uh, uh, read about such things. Uh, but uh, I don't uh, really think about it because, um, you know, you just start on a project and you draw on everything you you can from the place from from your experience and uh, from your heart and um, and uh, you 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 can't s stop and worry about how new it is or how old it is or where it came from completely do I have different concerns than I did at the beginning oh probably yeah but um, it, it, uh, that, that's, it, it doesn't help me particularly to, uh, to root those out and separate them and, and, uh, and think about them. Let, let somebody else do that. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just, 
I'm just interested in actually people ask me what's your favorite building and I always answer and I think this is the God's truth it's the one I'm working on now well thank you for the question it's a very a personal one and uh, and, and and very essential uh, kind of question I I addressed it in a lecture uh, here at the museum, not in this hall, in the DeBost Auditorium, about uh, three or four years ago. And so those of you who might have heard that lecture will forgive me if I uh, uh, say again to you uh, quickly what I said then. And it was that um, I, I often go, uh, go back and and uh, look at that particular juncture in my life and that, that decision to come back. There's a hint of it even in this talk, you know, when I talk about Michael and what he did and so forth. And um, I think I was uh, concerned with, with the fact that um, I had an obligation here that um, I come from a, from a family, and I don't say this boastingly at all, a family who uh, had founded, had been among the founders of the town, and, and on both sides, my mother's and father's side. And um, I'd also, w was the son and grandson of, of um, distinguished uh, people that, I felt from earliest childhood I could never live up to. And, uh, and there, w there must have been something in my decision that, that uh, I still was going to try and live up to them, to those. Uh, they, they, were all, they had the same name as, as I did. And having the same name is a, a sort of, uh, puts a sort of a curse on you in a way. Are you are you going to be uh, you know um, are you going to be up to those people, and um, I, I thought it was going to be hard, but I didn't think I thought if I was going to do it, I had to do it here, and um, and uh, that's sort of wacky in retrospect, but um, that was uh, part of my part of my feeling, and uh, and also. Um, the woman I wanted to marry was firmly entrenched in Indianapolis. <laughs> <laughs>